Good morning. A, a quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Rethinking Our Defense Budget, Achieving National Security Through Sustainable Spending, will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that only the Chairman and Ranking Members of the Subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that Congressman Barney Frank and Congressman Ron Paul be allowed to participate in this hearing if they are able to attend. In accordance with committee rules, they'll only be allowed to question the witnesses after all official members of the subcommittee have first had their turn. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee will be allowed to submit a written statement for the record, again, without objection, so ordered. Once again, good morning, and thank our witnesses for being here this morning to assist us. Today, the subcommittee continues its oversight of spending of the Department of Defense. Specifically, we'll examine recommendations from a number of defense experts for ways that we can reduce defense spending while ensuring that our national security interests are not compromised. Over the last two Congresses, this subcommittee has devoted significant time and resources to oversight of defense spending. We have examined the defense acquisitions process and have worked to ensure that adequate planning and testing is completed before multi-billion dollar weapon systems were purchased. We have investigated contracting in our overseas military operations and discovered widespread waste lack of management, and blindness to broader security implications of these problems. We have looked closely at the Missile Defense Agency, military aid programs, and strategic planning for new technologies such as the unmanned aerial vehicles. We continue to try to get a clear picture from the Department of the actual number of overseas military bases we have, as well as the strategic rationale for each location. Time and again, we see opportunities for increased efficiency, less waste, and better use of taxpayer money. Just two weeks before President Obama was sworn into office in January of 2009, the Congressional Budget Office announced that the fiscal year deficit was estimated at over $1 trillion. The inauguration occurred with an anticipated estimated long-range deficit of $11.5 trillion. In February of this year, President Obama established a bipartisan National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. This commission has been tasked with finding ways to improve the long-term fiscal outlook of the United States. It is critical that the Commission scrutinize all aspects of our budget, including the defense budget as it formulates its suggestions. I hope, in fact, that members of the Commission will pay close attention to our discussion here today. And in fact, I'm scheduled to meet with the Commission's co-chairs tomorrow afternoon, at which time I intend, them to, intend to urge them to do just that. Today, we will consider options for realigning our national defense spending. We have with us a panel of experts from diverse political viewpoints who will speak about ways that they and others who work with them on the related report believe we can cut the defense budget while maintaining our commitment to national security. Two of our witnesses are members of the Sustainable Defense Task Force, which has recently released that report with recommendations that, if implemented, would reduce the department budget by some $960 billion by the year 2020. Neither I nor the individual members of the subcommittee are bound to agree with each and every recommendation made by the report or in the testimony today. Yet most of the members would, I believe, welcome consideration of the topic and a number of the individual suggestions that are proffered. We look forward to the discussion of those recommendations as well as any additional suggestions from our panel. To be absolutely clear, this discussion should not be dismissed, as it may be by some, as an attempt to weaken the Department of Defense or under-prioritize United States national security. As this subcommittee's track record demonstrates, every member of this panel takes the security of our country very seriously. Waste is waste regardless of the context, and inefficiencies only hurt our ability to respond effectively to crisis and promote our national security interests. Should national security in an austere budget environment, sound national security in an austere budget environment requires strategic choices and rational resource allocation. Bigger is not always better, especially in matters of national defense. Budgets always involve hard choices, but in this case, these choices can be made and make our nation stronger. It is through that lens that we approach our conversation today. It's our duty on this subcommittee and in the Congress as a whole to make certain that taxpayer money is spent responsibly. As President Obama has said, quote, we have an obligation to future generations to address our long-term structural deficits, which threaten to ho hobble our economy and leave our children and grandchildren with a mountain of debt, close quote. The critical importance of our national security does not in any way exempt the Defense Department from its obligations to spend money wisely and efficiently. With that, I'd like to recognize Mr. Flake for his opening comments. I thank the chairman and thank the witnesses for coming in. As the chairman noted, uh, every member of this panel takes uh, the defense of our country seriously, uh, but we also recognize that we have a, a huge problem in terms of de deficit. 
and uh, savings cannot be uh, simply uh, gained in entitlement programs. By about 96 percent in real terms. This has no precedent in all the years since the Korean War. The post-1998 defense boon is nearly as great as those enacted by Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Reagan combined. And only about half of the recent increase is due to our recent wars and contingency operations. Whether one looks at the total DOD budget or just that portion not attributable to today's wars, U.S. defense spending is now stabilizing at levels significantly above the Cold War peaks. Clearly what has occasioned, what has not occasioned this surge is a neck in neck race with a peer competitor. There is none. But what we have seen over the past 10 and 12 years, somewhat more actually, is a substantial expansion in the goals, roles, and missions assigned to our armed forces. Beginning at the end of the Cold War, we pushed our armed forces to prepare for and conduct more types of missions and activities faster and more frequently across a broader expanse of the earth than ever before. And we set out goals that reached well beyond the traditional ones of simple defense and deterrence. We added various forms of preventative action, not only preventative war and regime change, but also greater reliance on our military to shape the strategic environment and transform entire nations. In this light, it's not surprising that we've moved from spending only two-thirds as much as our adversaries during the Cold War to spending more than twice as much today. And that discounts our war spending. Had President Reagan sought an advantage this great, he would have had to triple his budgets. The spending balance reflects the fact that we enjoy abundant overmatch in the conventional realm. And one criteria that we employed in the report and coming up with our recommendations was to trade down some of this overmatch. Another step we took was to roll back some of the soft uses of our military power, so-called environment shaping functions, where costs are high and payoff is indeterminate. What we focused on were the surge requirements for war in dealing with the conventional realm. A different picture emerges when we survey our recent experience in large-scale counterinsurgency wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. Rather than overmatch, what we see is mismatch. The task force exempted war spending from its cut options. We didn't examine the money uh, uh, that is spent on war. We cordoned that off. And we pegged those spending cuts that we did propose. So, well, some would directly affect the wars. Those that would, we pegged to the wars winding down. An example would be uh, reductions in ground forces. Likewise, we cordoned off capabilities directly relevant to counterterrorism, such as special operations forces and intelligence, although the latter, uh, given recent news, may deserve a second look. This doesn't imply that we uh, support the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or we oppose them. Uh, that wasn't our intention. We wanted to look at the long-term budget. However, some of our options do assume that in the long term, we are not likely to repeat those experiences again. The fabulous cost, the slow progress, and the uncertain outcome of recent efforts at regime change, armed nation building, and large-scale counterinsurgency make them a poor strategic choice. And there's, there's two parts to that conclusion. One, that it is a choice that we've made. And two, that it's a bad one. Those are some of the uh, concerns, some of the criteria we brought to bear in developing the options. We can discuss uh, others later. I think really the most fundamental point we want to make is that we need to look at this budget with new eyes. And our principal concern cannot be about guns versus butter. Our principal concern has got to be refurbishing and preserving national strength. That's got to be the criteria that we bring to bear in all of our decisions from this point forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Canada. I was thinking that it was just me referring to you as Dr. Canada, but now I see that your parents, if they're watching, will be able to see that title in front of you for the entire time. So good for you. <laughs> Mr. Friedman, if you would. I also want to thank uh, the chairman and, and the ranking member and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. I'm, I'm especially pleased to be here with this distinguished panel, most of whom have been in this business uh, since I was a kid or younger. Uh, I want to make two main points today. Uh, first, substantially reducing military spending requires reducing the ambitions it serves. 
Second, a more restrained defense strategy would not only allow cost savings, it would actually improve our security. I am uh, agnostic as to whether our current defense budget uh, is sustainable. I think many foolish, foolish things are sustainable, at least for a while. What I do believe is that it would be unwise to spend anything like the $549 billion that the administration requested in the, in the base budget, uh, a non-war budget for fiscal year 2011. I think there's no good reason we should now spend more on the non-war defense budget in real terms than we did in any year during the Cold War. So I advocate a more modest defense strategy, one that I call restraint because it starts with the assumption that power tempts us to take part in foreign troubles that we could and should avoid. Restraint means resist, resisting that temptation. It would husband American power rather than dissipate it in pursuit of ideological and unreachable goals. Restraint does not require cuts in military force structure and spending. It allows them. A less busy military uh, could be a smaller and cheaper one. Now, an alternative uh, approach to saving on defense is to pursue the same ends uh, more efficiently. Uh, efforts to streamline uh, the Pentagon's operations through acquisition reform, elim eliminating waste and duplication, or improving financial management uh, might save some money, but these reforms have historically delivered few savings, probably because what seems inefficient from a business standpoint, uh, whether it's maintaining essentially two air forces, keeping twice as many shipyards open as we need, or building uh, gold-plated weapon systems, is actually efficient in producing political goods, whether it's uh, servants, the services preferences for weapons or jobs. So uh, rather than efficiency driving savings, I think spending cuts ought to drive efficiency. Market competition encourages private organizations to streamline their operations. When, and while no such pressure exists in government, uh, by cutting the top line and forcing the services to compete for their budgets, I think we can incentivize them to find some efficiencies themselves. Uh, that said, I think it would be a mistake to take up the four structure reductions recommended in my written testimony without their strategic rationale. I think that would badly overburden the force, which would be unfair, uh, without improving security. Uh, so as I suggested, the real driver of excessive defense spending is a lack of prioritization, which is the essence of strategy. We spend too much because we choose too little. Um, Unbalanced power and massive budgets have limited the need to choose among priorities. We confuse the necessary with the desirable, our sympathies with the requirements of our safety. The truth is uh, that the United States doesn't really have a defense budget. I think that adjective is wrong. I think our military forces size and composition now lack a meaningful relationship to the requirements of protecting Americans. For example, our security no longer requires that we defend the European Union, which has a collective economy larger than our own, uh, from Russia or its own dissolution. I think peace among European states is deep-seated. Russia, which now spends less on its aging military than we spend on researching and developing new weapons alone, is not about to reclaim its Soviet empire, let alone threaten Western Europe. South Korea, likewise, uh, long, ago, long ago grew wealthy enough and then some to defend itself against the North. And uh, neither do we need to defend J Japan from China. I think history suggests that the likely result of withdrawing U.S. forces and commitments from Japan will be slightly higher defense spending in Japan and a stable balance of power in China, in large parts because they're separated by a decent-sized body of water. Those states uh, don't have a, a much to fight over today. I also think there's little basis for the claim that you often hear that global trade depends on U.S. military deployments overseas. I think that that theory is a little bit too esoteric to discuss briefly here, but I, I will say that the historical and theoretical case for it is thin. I think it exaggerates the fragility of global markets and trade and the economic impact that supply disruption in a particular region uh, would cause here in the United States. Uh, nor is it wise, I think, to spend heavily on defense today to hedge against the rise of uh, possible future challengers like China. Uh, the smaller military that I recommend would maintain a vast superiority over China and all other states for the foreseeable future, uh, particularly at sea and in the air. But the, the best defense against an uncertain future is a prosperous economy unburdened by excessive spending and debt, which can finance a buildup of military capability if need be. I'll also say that counterterrorism uh, does not require great military spending. The military assets best suited to that are relatively cheap uh, niche capabilities, UAVs, intelligence collectors, and special operations forces. Uh, the theory that we can only be safe from jihadists by occupying and ordering the states where they operate has been tested and proved prohibitively costly in blood and treasure. We have 
been reminded there that we lack the power to organize the politics of uh, unruly foreign states, and evidence suggests, I think, that trying to do so makes us uh, more likely to be a target of terrorism than prevent it. And so state building and occupations, I think, are a business that we should avoid once the current wars end, and that uh, ought to drive down the size uh, required of our ground forces. Uh, so to conclude, defining security so broadly is actually counterproductive. Our military posture and activism globally drag us into others' conflicts, provoke animosity, and prompt states uh, to balance our power by arming, driving proliferation. By capitalizing on our geopolitical fortune, we can safely spend far less. By avoiding the occupation of failing states and shedding commitments to defend healthy ones, we could plan for fewer wars. By shedding missions, we can cut force structure, reducing the number of U.S. military personnel and the weapons and vehicles we procure for them, particularly in the ground forces, and reduce operational costs. And uh, my written testimony specifies the cuts I recommend to that end. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Harrison. Uh, I'd like to thank the subcommittee uh, for the opportunity to share with you some of my thoughts on rethinking the defense budget. I've organized my remarks into five potential areas of savings, uh, which address many of the options that are presented in the report of the Sustainable Defense Task Force. The first two areas, achieving greater efficiencies and refocusing on the core business of defense, are changes that do not affect the size, composition, or capabilities of the military. And the savings in these areas are quite modest. Three other areas of savings, reforming the military personnel system, reforming the acquisition system, and altering the force structure have the potential to yield much greater savings, but they involve more substantive changes in the missions and capabilities supported by DOD. The first area is achieving greater efficiencies. Pentagon has again renewed its uh, efforts to reduce waste and achieve greater efficiencies with Secretary Gates' uh, speech last May uh, directing the services to take an unsparing look at how they operate. Under Secretary Carter has followed up uh, with some specific proposals. Many of these proposals are things that have been tried in the past with various degrees of success. And while working to achieve greater efficiencies should always be a goal of the department, efficiencies alone are not likely to result in the magnitude of savings needed over the coming decade. As Undersecretary Hale noted in a 2002 report on promoting efficiency in DOD, keep trying but be realistic. The second area of savings is re refocusing on the core business of defense. Many programs and activities that are funded within the defense budget stray far from DOD's core mission to deter war and to protect the security of our country. The task force recommends combining the military exchanges and commissaries to achieve savings. I would go one step further and ask why should DOD be operating a chain of retail stores at all? The exchanges and commissaries are an artifact of a bygone era and could be closed or sold to a private operator. Another activity outside the core business of defense that the task force did not address is the DOD funded and operated primary and secondary school system within the United States. I should note that I'm only talking about the DOD schools within the, U within the U.S., not the schools that DOD operates in foreign countries around the world where military families would likely not have access to an American-style school otherwise. Uh, in the U.S., though, education has primarily been the responsibility of the states. DOD notes in its annual report on these schools that the U.S. schools date back to a time uh, of a frontier army post when, quote, adequate public education was not available in the local area. This is no longer the case in the seven states where these schools are located. And since K-12 education is not core to the business of defense, DOD should transfer these schools either to the states in which they reside or to the Department of Education. The resulting savings in the defense budget could total some $750 million annually. The third area of savings I'd like to address is reforming the military personnel system. DOD is the single largest employer in the United States. It accounts for 51 percent of federal workers and employs more people than Walmart and the post office combined. Therefore, any changes to military pay and benefits have a profound and lasting effect on the federal budget. Since FY2000, total military personnel and health care cost per active duty troop has risen 73 percent in real terms. What is most concerning is that the cost structure within the military compensation system has grown out of balance. For the Department of Defense, 52 percent of total compensation goes to non-cash and deferred benefits, compared to an average of 29 percent in the private sector. 
And just as some private companies have been struggling to remain competitive under the heavy burden of excessive labor costs, so too will the Department of Defense struggle in the years ahead to maintain its force structure if labor costs are not brought back into balance. The task force makes several good proposals in this area, calling for changes to the way pay raises are calculated and raising the enrollment fees military retirees pay for TRICARE. Uh, what the what the task force doesn't address are problems with the military retirement system. DOD currently uses a cliff vesting retirement system where benefits only become effective after 20 years of service. This system creates distorted incentives because it encourages personnel nearing the 20 year mark to stay on duty even if only for the purpose of attaining the benefit. And after 20 years when personnel are often in their early 40s, the incentive sharply reverses encouraging personnel to retire early since they can continue making 50% or more of their military pay while simultaneously drawing full pay at a civilian job. For ways to reform the military retirement system, I would draw your attention to the 10th Quadrennial Review of Military Compensation. One of the most attractive options in this report that this report proposes is to transition from the current defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan, more like a 401k, just as many businesses and state governments have done. The fourth area of savings is reforming the acquisition system. I would divide acquisition reform into two areas, reforming what DOD buys and reforming how DOD buys. Eleven of the 19 options in the task force's report fall into the category of reforming what DOD buys. It's true that cutting acquisition programs can yield some of the greatest savings, but such decisions should not be based on budget considerations alone. They should consider which missions and capabilities DOD no longer needs to support and what the effect will be on the industrial base. The task force does not address the issue of reforming how DOD buys things, that is, the acquisition process itself. I would draw your attention to one issue in particular, and that is too many requirements being piled onto weapon systems. Many different organizations within the department have a role in the requirements process, ranging from the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, the JROC, to the various organizations within OSD that review and approve programs as they pass through acquisition milestones. Yet few of the organizations that have the power to add, modify, or otherwise influence requirements also have the responsibility to fund programs. Creating a better organizational alignment between those who set requirements and those who budget for programs would reduce the incentive to add the kinds of exquisite requirements that drive up costs and stretch out schedules. The fifth and final area of savings I'd like to address is altering the force structure. The task force recommends several changes to the force structure, including reducing U.S. troops in Asia and Europe by one-third and rolling back the size of the Army and the Marine Corps to pre-2007 levels. If the primary intent of these measures is simply to reduce personnel costs, the department would be better served in the long run by first tackling the underlying labor cost structure and only then adjusting the size of the force as necessary. And again, such decisions should not be based on budgetary factors alone. They should be informed by a realistic assessment of future threat environment and a determination of where the department is willing to take risk, a strategic approach. In conclusion, I'd like to note that while a declining defense budget would force the department to make many difficult decisions, it also presents an opportunity. It's an opportunity to transform the military into a more efficient and effective force. Ironically, the ra rapid rise of the base defense budget over the past decade may have prevented the department from transforming because it allowed the services to continue funding existing programs and not fully commit to transformation. But the era of constrained resources that is now upon us may finally force the services to make the difficult choices that are necessary to create a more efficient and effective military. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Schmidt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Flake, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> um, I, I noticed that there's five of us up here on the panel. and. And if this was a, a, a hand, I suspect I'm going to be the sore thumb. Um, so will let me... Could have been otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the hammer is about ready to hit me. So. Uh, let me begin with the obvious. Uh, we do spend a lot on defense. Um, the task force report is absolutely right when it says that nearly 65% of the increase in federal discretionary spending since 2001 uh, has come from an increase in the Pentagon's budget. But I would say this is a bit misleading. First. We are at war, after all. Uh, and even in that, as a percentage of the GDP, these wars have been waged more cheaply than similar wars such as Korea or Vietnam. 
Second, from 2001 to 2010, the baseline defense budget grew by $228 billion. This amounts to an annual real rate of growth of just 4%. Growth to be sure, but not the gusher Secretary Gates spoke of in May at the Eisenhower Library. And certainly the $228 billion pales in comparison with the nearly $800 billion spent to stimulate, supposedly, the economy. The report begins with a quote from my good friend Corey Shockey, a former Bush national security official and a McCain campaign advisor. Corey is quoted as saying, quote, conservatives need to understand that military power is fundamentally premised on the solvency of the American government and vibrancy of the U.S. economy. I certainly don't disagree. But as she herself states in a recent uh, article, in a recent post, quote, advocates of a strong national defense ought to be thinking seriously about entitlement reform. That is Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Referencing Congressman Ryan's Roadmap for America, she goes on to say that the real threat to end the adequate defense spending is the explosion in domestic programs. Quote, defense spending isn't addressed in the roadmap because it's not material to the overall debt picture, end quote. From this perspective, the real problem is not dispense defense spending, but the fact that some 56% 50, of federal outlay, outlays are tied to mandatory spending accounts and will, if current budget estimates hold true, expand at an even greater rate. Defense, meanwhile, accounts for 18% of those outlay, outlays and will shrink to just 15% in the near, near years. Now, the task force report, Debts, Deficit, and Defense, is right to think that if a trillion dollars could be cut from de defense, it would make a difference. I agree. However, let's remember that $300 billion has already been cut from defense the past two years, and to follow the report uh, recommendation requires, in my opinion, taking some or other risky steps. However, rather than go through the report's uh, specific list of recommendations, which I'd be happy to talk about in more detail in the question and answer session, let me make the broad point that the force structure they outline is one that runs against the basic force structure that has been agreed upon by three successive administrations, two Democrat and one Republican. It seems to me that we ought to think twice before jettisoning a force structure that by any standard has performed remarkably well, has done so at a very high tempo, and has enjoyed bipartisan post-Cold War support far more than, for more than a decade and a half. Now, having said that, there's no question that savings can be had when it comes to defense. Uh, Todd here, I think, has laid out a number of useful proposals. Health and personnel costs have skyrocketed over the past decade, and while benefits for those in the all-volunteer force must remain high, there's no question that the, there are elements of the Pentagon's budget that need closer scrutiny. However, the real problem, and I realize just how difficult an argument it, it is to make these days, is that we spend too little on defense. The key point here is that the procurement holiday that marked much of the 1990s was a hole the Bush administration never dug the Pentagon out of. And now the Obama administration wants to hold defense spending flat or less in the coming years, which, when combined with the rising personnel costs and rising operations and maintenance costs, has resulted in a significant shortage in resources, perhaps, according to the Congressional, Congressional Budget Office, on the order of 30 to $40 billion a year needed to recapitalize our armed forces. All of which brings me to my final point. The danger today is that the chronic underfunding of our core defense capabilities, we will slip into a posture of strategic retrenchment through inadvertence. In this respect, one of the virtues of the report is that it does not hide the strategic implications of its cuts, raising at the end a very different vision for American grand strategy from what it has been. By my lights, it's a path I prefer we not take. I don't think we should let go of a strategy that has, among other things, successfully prevented destructive wars between the great powers and help shape an international order which for all its problems remains relatively stable. No doubt it has, a, it has cost the American taxpayer a lot, of, a lot to maintain, but the benefits we have gotten in return in terms of general peace, the expansion of democratic rule around the globe, and our own prosperity, I believe, are benefits that are far greater. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Adams. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Tierney. Uh, Congressman Flake, appreciate the opportunity to testify here. One of the advantages, of course, of coming last is that everybody's already said the things I was going to say, but of course not everybody's said them, so I will try to be brief. 
Um, I want to make three very simple points and introduce my testimony for the record, as, uh, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman. Uh, simple point uh, number one is the Defense Department is now facing a planning crisis that it is not yet ant fully anticipated, uh, and it's not yet ready to cope with what is going to hit it. Uh, all budgets, in fact, all planning in the federal government is resource constrained. Uh, so we cannot sit here and say we totally want the force that we want to have and we want it to do what we want it to do independent of resources. It's always been resource constrained and this week, of course, the Congress is beginning the process of marking up appropriations for fiscal 2011, which is going to constrain, among other things, defense from the administration's request. But even that constraint doesn't begin to cope with the tidal waves that are hitting the Department of Defense over the next two or three years and over the next decade, which all of you in Congress are going to have to deal with. The tidal waves take two forms. Tidal wave number one, which has been amply discussed here, is the tidal wave of deficits and debt uh, at historically high shares of, of gross domestic product, and frankly with forecasts for the debt and those deficits that are still quite optimistic compared to what we may encounter as Congress works through the fiscal agenda over the next few years. Uh, second tidal wave hitting defense is that we are, in fact, at some point, not too distant future, pulling back from Iraq, pulling back from Afghanistan, uh, which means that the public willingness to tolerate extremely high and unprecedentedly high levels of defense spending is going to weaken and go away. That is the natural course of things. Now, we have been to this movie before. We were at this movie from 1985 to 1998. From 1985, when deficit reduction began through 1998, overall national defense outlays fell 20% in constant dollars. DOD budgets fell 36% in constant dollars over that period of time. Uh, what caused that change? Step one, a major attention of the Congress and the White House to deficits and debt reduction. Step number two, the end of the Cold War, where the major strategic planning scenario that undergirded our defense budget disappeared. Combining those two things, starting with the, the Bush, first Bush administration, those budgets went down, the force structure shrank by a third, 50% cut in, in constant dollars in procurement budgets, and lots of program kills. Most of them begun under the Bush administration. But that is what happens as the cycle of defense changes and as the politics of the globe change. Uh, so we are heading for another one of those uh, periods in our history, and you in Congress are going to have to cope with it. The department is not yet there. Second point I want to make is the tried and true way of achieving savings, some of which have been mentioned in testimony so far, are inadequate to cope with, with this decline. Uh, in fact, we've created pressures for upward growth in defense budgets over the last decade. End strength has grown, not shrunk. End strength determines a lot of where the budget is going. Personnel costs have been growing faster than personnel costs in the economy as a whole. Uh, the uh, retirement costs for the Department of Defense personnel have grown. Health care has grown at a faster rate than Medicare costs have grown. Overhead has grown, meaning the tail is now larger than the tooth, is now becoming larger than the tooth. Operations and maintenance costs grow inexorably at 2.5% per year, and that seems to not change regardless of party administration or era. And acquisition reform. A much touted acquisition reform currently is really, frankly, a recycling of ideas we've dealt with before. Acquisition reform keeps proving to be a mirage. And it's a mirage, frankly, because in the acquisition system, the incentives are wrong. It's not just a question of requirements. If services have to buy in to get systems at an affordable budget, they'll buy in at a cheaper cost than they project the system to cost. If contractors have to buy in in order to win a contract, they will buy in at a cheaper cost than the system turns out to cost. So the incentive structure makes acquisition reform an uphill battle. Third point I want to make. Uh, I think that uh, Secretary Gates, who is trying to protect 1% real growth in defense budgets, uh, is actually fighting a losing battle. And the key to now constraining defense is going to be in mission discipline. Sadly, the Quadrennial Defense Review did not execute mission discipline. It simply layered missions on top of each other without setting priorities and without calculating the risks of the various missions and the risks that we as a nation are prepared to tolerate. Uh, I can associate myself with many of the comments that have been made about mission, but I think we are at a point in American history where a serious baseline discussion of strategy and mission is an essential part of how we approach defense planning and defense forces. 
Uh, the bottom line here has to do with looking seriously at counterterror missions and whether they should have been fenced, looking at the counterinsurgency stabilization and nation building missions so we don't draw the wrong lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan, looking carefully at how many nations in the world we want to build partner capacity in, ensuring that we maintain deterrence, alliance support, and conventional war in what is one of the safest periods in our national security history. And finally, in looking seriously at rebalancing the toolkit, so we in fact do more strategic planning with civilian agencies, we make governance, stabilization, and reconstruction civilian, not military missions, and reinforce our diplomacy. Last point, um, I would urge the Congress to give serious consideration to unifying the budget functions for defense and foreign policy so we can make those kinds of trade-offs. So in sum, uh, defense budgets are resource constrained. The current tools for dealing with those resource constraints are inadequate. And indeed, as was said earlier on this panel, I think it was Dr. Friedman who said it, spending cuts will drive efficiencies. We've seen that before. I predict we will see it again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Adams, and thank all of you for your testimony, written and uh, verbal here today. We're going to go to our question period here, five minutes per member, and I'm going to start. But I, I think it's a great jumping off point from Dr. Adams' comments, which were reflected uh, in some of the other testimony here. Is I don't know that we really have a budget in the Department of Defense. Uh, it seems to me that we just spend whatever we, uh, we think we want to spend. And uh, I think the last comment about piling on mission on top of mission just seems to be going. And if we have a weakness in our civilian capacities, then we ask the military to take that on. Uh, it's not to say that they're not, a, they're not good at it, they're not willing to do it, or they're not well-intentioned, but it uh, sometimes seems out of line for what they really uh, are proposed to do and designed to do uh, on that. So let me ask this generally. You know, if we were to concentrate just on making the military that we have more efficient, um, getting rid of some waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, are we all pretty much in agreement that would be a far less significant uh, savings than if we really took a look at the mission and took a look at uh, just how we structure it, what are the, uh, the purposes of the mission of the Department of Defense? Do we have any disagreement on that, Dr. Schmidt? Do you disagree with that? No, absolutely not. I mean, I think the, the best you can expect out of efficiency of any government organization is probably 5 percent, and, right. and boy, is that even hard to do. So, yeah, yeah you're well, really That's a big number. I mean, if we could get 5 percent, I guess, in this world, we'd well, all be pretty the, happy on that's uh, the golden on apple, basis. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't yeah. count on it either. We're trying. Uh, you know, we have a lot of hearings in that uh, design on that. But the, uh, you know, uh, the other part is I, I would suspect that, you know, we have to worry about efficiencies and a budget within the Department of Defense. But as policymakers, we ought to also look at what the Department of Defense budget is within our overall uh, budget uh, on that basis and, and take a look. And I think a number of you have testified that, you know, you, you think that there's uh, a situation here where uh, what happens, what is spent in the military is material uh, to the overall debt picture, except, Dr. Schmidt, you, you quoted uh, somebody in your testimony saying that they didn't think that the, um, the defense spending was material at all to the overall debt picture. Is that a position you would endorse? Uh, no, not technically. I mean, look, it obviously would help to cut defense spending. Um, and, but I also think that the costs for, for the kinds of cuts that have been proposed by the task force really put, um, raise larger questions about the ultimate cost of the country. So on the whole, I would say the real problem fiscally, yes, defense cuts would help fiscally, but not substantially, and that the real issue is the entitlement programs. Mr. Chairman, could I uh, comment yeah, briefly I'd like on just somebody some, to comment on some that, data? Adams. The uh, uh, defense has obviously played a role. The largest single source of spending growth over the past decade in, in the federal government has obviously been on the mandatory side. On the discretionary side, the defense budget has gone up, has some, absorbed something like two-thirds of the overall increase in discretionary spending. And that's been driven in large part by war costs, the costs of Iraq and Afghanistan. So there's no question that it has contributed to our deficit. And interestingly, national defense has a over 19 percent uh, share of all fiscal 2010 federal spending, which is the same as Social Security, and it's 3 percent higher than of all means-tested entitlement programs combined. Now, that excludes Social Security because that's not means-tested. But if you look at means-tested programs, defense is obviously there's a kind of a third, a third, a third piece here in terms of uh, overall spending. So clearly, from the uh, spending side of the equation, what Congress faces and what I think anybody seriously addressing deficit reduction and debt control faces is how do you put all the pieces on the table at the same time?
since 1985 to 98, the period I mentioned earlier, what clearly made deficit reduction possible, because people disagree on where the cuts ought to come, was when that deficit exercise, starting with Graham Redmond Hollings in 1985, put all pieces of, in, of first discretionary spending on the table, and then with the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990, put discretionary mandatory and revenues on the table with both caps and pay go. Those two things in the 1990s, combined with a healthy economy, which we don't have right now, were enough to drive us into surplus by the end of the decade. Uh, if we even made some progress of that kind, it would be a good thing for the economy. The problem that we have is you can't get agreement, I believe, here in the Congress unless all those pieces are on the table, and that's going to inevitably involve the administration as well. So if you want to do it, you've got to do it with everything on the table. And I think indicative of this day, I don't think there's a lot of competing hearings out there necessarily, but I'm struck by the lack of attention to this particular subject, as if people don't want to deal with it or don't want to go there on that. Um, Mr. Knetter, um, do you see some value in our national security and whether or not our seniors are secure in their retirement, whether or not uh, people have health care, uh, whether or not they have uh, an opportunity for education, and whether or not that we, in fact, have job training and research and development, things like that. How does that play into our national security structure? There's been uh, a lot of interesting work done, uh, analysis of, uh, our, of our operations in war, of our success in war. Um, um, Stephen Biddle, uh, an analyst with the um, Council on Foreign Relations, and he's also been in the, uh, in the, um, in the, the service school system, um, has produced a number of reports looking at why we won so well, for instance, in the first uh, Persian Gulf War. Uh, often the assumption is that we win because of our technology. And what he demonstrates, I think, pretty convincingly that it's not that. We win because of a combination of our technology, our training, our people, our capacity to work as a team. We need to ask ourselves, well, the point I'm getting at here is that I think people are the most important part of our armed forces. We have a volunteer military um, and we are able to fill it with quality people. And why is that possible for us and not as possible for others, uh, other nations? And I think part of the answer is that we as a nation pay attention to the, the health, the education and the welfare of our people. So certainly that is a contributor, a factor uh, in our ability to put together the military we do. And I think that's the type of thinking we need to approach this quite, we need to approach it from that perspective. We need a holistic approach and to understand that many of the benefits are indirect, but they're real. Thank you very much. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Thank you all. That was very, very enlightening. Uh, Mr. Harrison, you mentioned that one of the problems we have with cost is uh, requirements keep getting piled on to weapon systems. Um, can you explain a little further on that. How does that raise costs and what can we do to remedy that? Well, what happens on acquisition programs is uh, as a, one of the services, you know, gets together and says, okay, we need some new weapon system to fill a capability gap. Um, and then uh, it goes up for review. The other services get their chance, their hack at it. The combatant commanders uh, get to look at it. Uh, and the more people that look at it, the more people that touch it, they tend to start adding more and more requirements to it. Uh, and even once the system begins development, people will look at it again and say, oh, well, you know,